I'm Stephanie Kobian. Thank you so much for joining us. This is our third TV Guestbert webinar series. I always say that I love each Guestbert that we've had so far, but it always is the truth. Uh, a couple months ago, we had um, Joanna Massey, and then we had Peter Bedard, and then now we have Gaini uh, De Silva, MD, she's a child and adolescent psychiatrist. She is one of my favorites as well. Um, known her probably for about 12 years, 10 years maybe. And um, again, personally and professionally, I just adore her. She is the author of two books that she's published through TV Expert, um, both a psychiatrist guide, one is helping parents reach their depressed tween, and the other one is stop teen addiction before it starts. Um, having read both of these, I think they're invaluable. So if you do have a kid or you even know other people who have kids, or honestly, it's just great take home information even for yourself. Um, I do recommend you go find those books because, again, she's got great information. So, Gaini has been a um, child and adolescent psychiatrist now for, what, probably almost 20 years now. Um, oh. Really enhancing mental health of children and adolescents, but she does work with um, adults as well. She works on a lot of different things regarding like mental illness, societal factors, interpersonal issues. You guys are going to learn a lot from her. She's really all about health and wellness. And she is so personable that um, it's on just another level, I think, in regards to being a doctor. She's just amazing and really knows how to talk to people. She's a great communicator. So um, I hope you guys enjoy today's webinar. Thank you, Gaini. If you do have questions during the webinar, please feel free to leave it either in the Q&A or the chat. I will come back at the end. If she doesn't answer it in the moment, we'll do a short Q&A at the end. So. Thank you, everybody, and I hope you enjoy. She's going to be discussing resolving anxiety and depression, especially after a 2020 difficult year for everybody, and hopefully we're going to start be having some relief very soon. So thank you for joining, everyone. Thank you, Stephanie, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm not sure I deserve all the wonderful things you said about me, but thank you. I appreciate it. So um, like Stephanie said, I am a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I'm a board certified psychiatrist and did fellowship training in child and adolescent um, psychiatry in New Mexico and um, in Albuquerque. And I'm currently the uh, medical director of behavioral health at a pretty large uh, public health plan at IEHP. And I basically, um, what I try to do is educate the health plan and our community about psychiatry, about mental illness, about the integration of uh, mental illness and physical health and how, how they're really just one and the same. Um, one affects the other and uh, you can't really separate behavioral health and mental health with physical health. And um, I do that through a podcast that I host called Chat and Chai. And, um, and I do that uh, through all the programs that we promote and develop at the health plan, increasing access to health care, mental health care in the San Bernardino County and uh, Riverside County areas in California. I'm, um, I'm actually doing a little job change over to um, be chief of psychiatry with San Bernardino County uh, jails. Um, in the next couple of months, but I'll stay on at IHP as a consultant. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. I, I love working with disenfranchised um, populations and especially in the jail system where I think that there's a lot of opportunity to make change and to help motivate people to change and to feel better and to make um, healthier decisions um, that both impact themselves and then society also. So one of the one of the things I've noticed about the jail system is that um, the concept of rehabilitation and change sometimes gets uh, put to the side or not even acknowledged. So uh, one of my goals in life, uh, one of my passions really is to uh, motivate people and to um, bring awareness to all the the nuances and all the all the even the little spaces and times that we have to uh, help people feel better and make changes in their lives and impact other people too with uh, compassion and kindness. I have a teenage son, so a lot of what I talk about, a lot of the pictures that you're going to see in this presentation will uh, will feature him. He certainly has taught me probably more uh, than um, than any anything else that I've done is uh, is working with him and being really 
um, present with him and mindful about his development and being the best mom that I can be to him has taught me more about life than, I, than anything else. And then uh, I already told you about being a host of um, the podcast Chat and Chai, which you can find on Apple iTunes and Spreaker and Google and uh, wherever else uh, uh, podcasts are, um, are accessible. So today we're going to talk about resolving anxiety and depression. Um, the overview, we're going to talk about what anxiety is. We're going to talk about what is depression. Uh, I see depression and anxiety as two sides of the same coin. So we're going to talk about that too a little bit. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about treatment from a medical perspective and then treatment from a psychological perspective. But what I really want to concentrate on are the tools, the personal tools that we can use to resolve anxiety and depression. And then also the parenting tools, because uh, it, whether you're a parent um, or not a parent, we all interact with children. And I think children's needs are, uh, are global. And if you're an adult, we should be considering children in anything and everything that we do. And then of course questions. We'll have that time at the end to talk about questions, but I, um, I like to teach and I like to present in a way that's quite interactive. So if you wanna go ahead and interrupt me with a question, please do. Um, I will keep an eye out on the chat. And, um, but if I missed your question, um, we'll be sure to get it at the end, okay? So what is anxiety? Well, anxiety is normal. We all have anxiety. And anxiety is not a bad thing. In fact, Jackie Jordan taught me uh, that anxiety is necessary and actually can help us in life. Uh, when I first started doing these uh, presentations, I was so incredibly anxious and actually I've suffered from anxiety my entire life. Um, as, as a child, I probably would have been diagnosed with selective mutism because I so rarely spoke up and I was so afraid of my anxiety. But as I've progressed through my career and tried things that made me super anxious, I've realized that anxiety can be quite helpful and we don't have to treat it as this horrible thing that's in our life. We can actually treat it like it's a friend, um, sometimes a very annoying friend or a, um, a disruptive friend or a debilitating friend, but a friend nevertheless. And if we can make friends with our anxiety, we start to look at it instead of trying to push it away or get rid of it, we start to look at it like, hey, what can I do with this friend? How can I understand this friend? How can I learn to have fun with this friend? How can I learn to take what this friend is trying to tell me and teach me? And maybe, maybe this friend has some advice to give me. So if we change our perspective and we look at anxiety in that way, it becomes much more helpful and we can use the anxiety to help us uh, move forward and reach our goals. It does take some courage and it does take some risk taking, right? Because it's a new thing to address anxiety in this way. Uh, but if we can hold that uh, anxiety about trying something new and say, all right, I'm going to go forward with my fear anyway, and use this anxiety to be energetic, like Jackie is talking about in the chat, uh, to propel us forward, then, then we've conquered a little bit of that anxiety, and we have come to understand our friend a little bit better, and we've actually gotten a little closer to our friend called anxiety. Anxiety can get problematic though, and this is where it becomes more of a mental illness than an issue that we have to deal with. So people can get panic attacks uh, when they're very, very anxious. And if you've never had a panic attack, um, it's really pretty scary and you start to feel like you're, you're losing control or you're going crazy. I was in a really bad car accident when I was about 30 years old. And after that, I did have some panic attacks when I would drive and sometimes even in other times I would have these panic attacks. And I didn't really know what was going on. I thought I was going crazy. I thought that was the only one in the room. The wall started to get really close on me. Uh, my heart rate would race and I would get really sweaty. I felt like I was, uh, weird really um but once i understood like oh that's just a panic attack i started to realize oh i must be really anxious and something is triggering that and then you could get help and talk to people and learn about how to uh expect that you're going to get anxious and then learn some tools breathing tools relaxation identifying your anxiety in order to mitigate the panic attack that that comes along and medications can be really helpful with that too and we'll talk a little bit about the medications um, in another uh, slide or two. 
you can have PTSD. So when you have a traumatic event happen, you can get a disorder called PTSD. And post-traumatic stress disorder is a syndrome of uh, symptoms, high anxiety, panic, a sense of foreshortened future where you can't see beyond maybe a couple of months, a couple of years. Uh, you can't really look five or 10 years down the road. Uh, and that's really anxiety kind of keeping that, um, that imagery at bay. Um, and then uh, you can get OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, which is where your mind has these obsessive thoughts and generates a ton of anxiety. And then you feel like you can't appease that anxiety unless you do something about it. You have to do the obsession. That's the compulsive part um, to, in order to um, satisfy the obsession, but it doesn't ever really satisfy that obsession. And typically you need some treatment in terms of therapy and medication in order to help lower that anxiety so that you don't feel so compulsive to act on the obsession. And then the obsessions also can come down. Those are the main anxiety disorders. There's also like social anxiety where people feel really anxious about going into social situations. And it can become so debilitating that people actually avoid going into social situations. They avoid going to school. They avoid going to work. They avoid going out with their friends because their social anxiety can be so high. Um, so those are the main anxiety disorders that we'll talk about or that are, that are there. And the depression, what is depression? Well, we all feel depressed from here, from time to time, right? There are so many, so many situations in life that are depressing and cause dysphoria, which is extreme sadness of mood. So it is a normal mood state, but the problematic part comes when you get stuck in depression. So a clinical depression is a whole body illness, just like anxiety is also a whole body illness, right? Like I described in panic attacks, we have your heart rate increase, your, your, get, your breath gets really short, you get sweaty. Well, depression is also a whole body illness and it affects the brain and it affects the muscles and affects the whole body so that people feel really tired, like they can't do anything. They're not being lazy. They're, yes, Jackie, that is my bunny. <laughs> That's Obi. Um, he's feeling a little uh, timid there um, in that picture. But the suppression can actually cause something called leaden paralysis, where you can't even move. Your muscles are so heavy that you can't move. It's hard to get out of bed. People have sleep disturbance. They may sleep more, like they sleep all day long and they're super tired. Or they will have difficulty falling asleep at nighttime and they're up at night or both. Um, they can feel really tired. Their thinking gets really slow. It's hard to remember things. It's hard to recall memories. You feel sad, you cry all the time. Um, you might feel numb. You might also feel anxious with depression and you might have feelings of wanting to die or hurt yourself. Um, and you have feelings of guilt, hopelessness, uh, irritability. You can feel what we call psychomotor retardation, which is your thinking is really slow and your body's really slow. And you can have what we call anhedonia, which is a loss of interest in things that you normally find quite interesting and bring you joy. So it's this loss of joy and it's prolonged. It lasts at least a week or even longer. And, uh, and most depressions need some kind of intervention in order to get better. Um, the normal um, kind of, uh, uh, timeline for a depression. Most people get out of it in about two months, but gosh, to be depressed for two months is an awfully long time. And of course, the risk of hurting yourself or having suicidal thoughts or committing suicide is, is very, very high. So if, if you do feel that deep depression, definitely uh, we want you to get some help um, from a professional so that we can help you with the depression and get it resolved pretty quickly. Um, so Gregory, you've asked the question, can anxiety be not just from current times in life, but also from the past and from the conscious or the inner child interactions? Absolutely. So anxiety and depression are quite complicated also, right? Um, so there's so many different areas that it can come from. It can come from right now, which we would call like a situational anxiety or situational depression. Um, right now, you know, with COVID and the pandemic and people being at home and dealing with this high level of stress and uncertainty and uh, mixed messages from our government and from the CDC and trying to stay healthy and keep our family healthy and having losses and people being quite sick all around us and so much change can cause 
a great deal of anxiety and depression. And people who have never really suffered from a clinical depression or clinical anxiety are now beginning to feel a lot of anxiety and depression. And in fact, one of my colleagues, who's the chief of psychiatry over at, um, at San Bernardino County, she yesterday said, you know what, I think we're now uh, entering into the second phase of the pandemic, which is this mental health pandemic. And I, and I agree with her, we're definitely seeing much more anxiety and much more depression being, um, being presented to us and people needing, needing treatment. And there's all sorts of trauma that happen uh, in the past that set people up for anxiety and depression. Um, that's for another talk with, that we can certainly do. I would love to talk about trauma and the effect of trauma on brain development and psychological de development because that's a huge, huge um, topic that we could all learn more about and absolutely um, it, it's affected and depression anxiety can come from that and the inner child that you talk about is really really important um, because we all have that inner child within us we have this, this this child that had so many needs as we were growing up and either intentionally or unintentionally or inadvertently um, unfortunately sometimes on purpose through abuse that the needs of the inner child weren't met but are still present as we become adults and and we need to address those those needs because they do become problematic as we try to have relationships in adult life or try to reach our goals or try to uh, understand how to have joy as an adult. So absolutely, Gregory, I'm so glad that you talked about that because it's super important to keep that in mind. Uh, will I cover ways to identify where anxiety may be coming out, coming from today? Um, we can, we can talk about that. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't planning on talking about that in particular because I was sort of focusing more on what to do when you have anxiety and depression. But, um, but if we have time, I will certainly um, come back to that. Thank you, Gregory. So anxiety and depression, they are, and this kind of answers your question a little bit, um, are two sides of the same coin. So basically when we as people, as children, um, children or adults, when we're faced with a conflict where we don't know what to do, we can psychologically take one or two stances and they're, they're, they're the same. It's either, uh, it's kind of like a fight or flight. We can either uh, take a passive kind of withdrawn approach and that's sort of the depressive stance or we can take a more active approach and that becomes a more anxious uh, stance, but they're still there. They're the same because they 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 come from the same conflict. So um, it, that that happens unconsciously. It's not a purposeful decision that we make. It's something that comes from our life experience and from our temperaments and our personalities that sort of lead us down one choice or the other. So it's not like we flip a coin, but we kind of do in our brain um, flip that coin, and then we go down that path of either becoming depressed and withdrawn or energetic and anxious. And so when we become depressed and withdrawn, we avoid, we isolate, we get really sad, we like crawl into ourselves and we develop these depressive symptoms. We get really um, hopeless and we start to feel guilty and we have a hard time reaching out to other people for help. And then when we're anxious though, we get really uh, worried and we have a lot of questions and, um, and we, uh, we start to do things and we start to have behaviors that don't really make sense, but it's all about trying to control that excited, anxious, worried response to a conflict. And both of these pathways, both of these stances that we take become very problematic when we're trying to actually have control of our lives and actually make active choices and move towards a goal. Um, but we can learn ways of learning about these two sides of the coin, accepting that we have these two sides of the coin, accepting that we have these kind of unconscious natural um, inclinations and preferences, and then learning how to actively choose behaviors and uh, ways of managing and coping tools in order to have more control and be more active and choose how to move forward in our lives and manage our feelings and not fall into a depressive episode or, or go into an anxiety disorder and, and become really tied up in that and then really need people and need some medication maybe to pull us out of that. Okay. 
So let's just talk about medications briefly because I am a doctor. Um, I'm a medical doctor and I do use medications in conjunction with therapy in order to help people feel better. Um, most of my patients are severely ill, so they're really depressed. They've most of them have tried uh, to commit suicide. Um, they're thinking about suicide all the time. Um, they're uh, hurting themselves or they're thinking about hurting themselves or they have in the past. Uh, and they, so they really do need antidepressants. And then people who have uh, anxiety disorders like um, panic disorder, PTSD, OCD, social anxiety, and they're really um, quite debilitated. So I do use medications quite a lot and very frequently. I try to be judicious and weigh out both medications and therapy. And I really think that people do best uh, when they're that severely um, ill with therapy and, uh, and medications. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about therapy because there are a whole range of therapies that, that we can use. It doesn't have to be that you go see a psychotherapist uh, in order to, um, to really get benefit from therapeutic approaches. Uh, but just kind of quickly go through. So there's the antidepressants. Um, the most common ones are the SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, uh, like Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, Paxil, Celexa. Trintellex, there's a whole bunch of them. And then some others that have a combination of both uh, serotonin and norepinephrine, um, which would be like uh, Wellbutrin, that's dopamine actually, and norepinephrine. And then Remeron, Mirtazapine, there's Raylar, there's um, Pristique and Effexor, uh, a bunch of antidepressants. There's so many choices uh, of antidepressants. And then there are older antidepressants too that we don't use so much, but sometimes people need those older antidepressants as well, but they have a lot of side effects. The, uh, the newer uh, antidepressants don't have so many side effects. They're very temporary. You might get a headache and stomach ache. They do go away uh, with a, in, within about a week or two, and they're very effective, but you've got to stay on them for about a year. Um, they start to take effect in a couple of weeks, and then they kind of reach this plateau, and it almost feels like you're back to ground zero. And I tell all my patients, you know, you're going to feel well in those first two weeks, and then you're going to feel really bad. Um, but let's try to get you through that because in another four weeks, you're going to start to feel good again, um, because the brain has to uh, adjust to the new medications. And they do, they really react with upgrading and downgrading different receptors. So the medicines don't seem like they work very well, but you got to keep taking it because um, the brain recalibrates to a new level of serotonin or norepinephrine or dopamine, and then you start to feel better again. And the reason why we need to have these, uh, these chemicals in the brain is because the brain communicates with each other, with different parts of the brain. So the nerves actual cells, they reach out to another cell. And the way they reach out and communicate to the next cell is through these chemicals. And so if we don't have enough chemicals to communicate with another, another cell, then there's no firing that happens. So one cell fires, it sends out, it's got to send out enough chemical to stimulate the other cell to fire and then go to another area of the brain that helps us think and helps us use the tools and, and, our, and our brains and our, our thinking and our cognitive uh, uh, paradigms and our, our, our different ways of thinking about a situation that can help us feel better. Um, so that's why the medications are really, really important. There are um, anti-anxiety medications like Xanax, Ativan, um, Valium that you may have heard of. And I really try to stay away from those medications, especially for people who have anxiety disorders and depression, because nothing feels as good as using one of those benzodiazepines for the first time, because they absolutely gets rid of all those, all that anxiety. But it never is the same after that. It, um, you build a tolerance to it. It's like drinking alcohol. You do develop a uh, dependency. It can set people up for addiction, especially if you use these medications, the benzodiazepines in the teenage years. Um, the brain develops between the ages of 13 and 27. It finishes de its development, particularly of the limbic system, which is a system in the brain that uh, manages emotions and where you learn how to uh, manage anxiety, depression, sadness, anger, irritability, uh, fear, 
um, and, and then the areas of the brain that are involved with dopamine and the reward system. So these medicines like benzodiazepines, alcohol, substances like uh, heroin and uh, speed, uh, the drugs of abuse, um, they trigger such a high dopamine response. And so the brain gets calibrated at that high dopamine response. So like usual activities like uh, an embrace with somebody who you like, uh, gives you a little bit of dopamine and oxytocin release, but uh, nothing near to like cocaine, which is going to give you this high dopamine um, response or benzodiazepine, which gives you a high dopamine response. And so, um, so it's really hard after you get used to that high dopamine response to feel good or feel joy or feel okay with these normal activities that just give you a little boost in dopamine. So what we really wanna encourage people, especially at this teenage level and young adult level is to learn to accept and, um, and really find joy in these little bumps in dopamine because that's where we live. Uh, if we can live in with these little, you know, with the little bump in dopamine, then we're going to be pretty content for the rest of our lives. We don't need those high dopamine um, stimulants. And the antidepressants, like the SSRIs that we use for depression, remember depression and anxiety are two sides of the same coin. So the antidepressants work great for anxiety. So a lot of people do get prescribed antidepressants like Prozac, Zoloft, Lexapro, Celexa for um, depression and for anxiety. And, um, and that's a good thing. Sometimes we'll use mood stabilizers like lithium and Depakote, Tegretol, Trileptal, Lamictal. These are really good for bipolar disorder, bipolar one or two, which we're not really gonna talk about, but they're a mood disorder where people have highs and lows, but they can be very helpful for uh, treatment of depression as well. It kind of augment the antidepressant with that. And then there are antipsychotic medications, which also at the very, very low doses do boost that ser serotonin. And there are a bunch of other augmentation strategies. And then there's ECT, which sounds kind of scary. It's electroconvulsive treatment. Um, but nowadays, it's not like one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It's really um, very targeted. It's uh, just one, um, usually just one pull and uh, to minimize the memory loss. But it's very effective for people who are severely depressed, who have psychotic features like hallucinations or paranoia, or who have really bad um, bipolar disorder, it is, um, it is the one medication that, oh, sorry, the one treatment that is pretty, uh, it works really fast and helps with suicidal uh, behavior and thinking. Also, uh, one of the mood stabilizers, lithium, uh, has, is the only medication we have actually that's been proven to help with suicidal uh, thinking and behavior. There is an antipsychotic medication, Clozero, but it has a lot of side effects and it's really only used in severe cases. And then TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which you're gonna hear a lot about. People do use that a lot for depression. Um, it's not the best treatment for depression. It's like a 50-50 chance. And it all depends on what kind of machine that you have. Um, but it is showing some promise with the more advanced machines in uh, OCD treatment. So anxiety disorder treatment. And we're gonna hear a lot more about that, I think, in the years to come. I spent a little more time on that than I, than I thought, but... Uh, Thank you, Stephanie. That is my, my, my dog, uh, one of my dogs. Um, he's a soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, Chewy. He is uh, very um, naughty, but adorable and lovable. And let's talk about talk therapy and other therapies, talking, communicating uh, with another person, getting some feedback is really the crux of treatment of anxiety and depression. So there are all sorts of psychotherapies. There's CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, dialectal behavioral therapy, which is kind of like CBT, but it really works on the, on the it's a dialectical, so it's, a, it's two person doing it. So the dynamic between two people uh, keeping the other person uh, safe. So it's really for people who struggle a lot with suicidal thoughts, self-harming behaviors, people who have been through a lot of trauma do very well with the DBT kind of treatments. Very, very intense. Uh, you need therapists who are specially trained in DBT to um, be very effective. And usually that therapist needs a whole group of people to support them also. And then there are group therapies, both with CBT and DBT and social skills development and um, just uh, therapeutic support in that group. Um, people tend to uh, 
to, to really take in information from their peers, sometimes a little more than they do from their professional. Uh, so the group therapy can be very um, helpful that way. And the family therapy is, um, is a fantastic modality also, especially if you have a teenager or a child who is exhibiting uh, signs of anxiety and depression. Um, I always say that any mental illness or mental issues or behavioral issues in children is not just confined to the child. It is a family issue. Uh, children do tend to be what we call the identified patient. And so they are like the shock absorbers for the family. And often their behavior and their problems or their struggles are reflective of other problems that are going on in the family. So um, I, I really like that. I like kids to be and families to be in family therapy whenever a child needs uh, behavioral treatment or is having uh, issues with any kind of uh, mental illness or mental health issues. Then there's pet assisted therapy, which is super helpful. And I think that during COVID, I, I, I do believe that people are uh, appreciating what their pets do for them. Uh, I know like I actually, I didn't even know COVID was about to come around, but my son wanted uh, a puppy, a, a little dog, um, because he really saw the my other dog, the picture that you saw as um, as my dog and, um, and he really kind of wanted his own dog so I did uh, we did get a little um, a little puppy who was just a, uh, about a seven and a half pound uh, dog and he has been my son's constant companion through COVID and um, and zoom online uh, schooling this year and I really think it's been so helpful for him to have his little dog with him as he's going through school and uh, they're they're two peas in a pod they're they're pretty much never separated. Um, so I'm a big proponent of pet assisted therapy. I think it's very helpful to help mitigate anxiety and depression and to maintain that, that connection. And we're going to talk about connection in just, just a little bit because I really think that uh, relationships and the connection that we have with other beings, other people, animals, is what helps buttress our mood and keeps us resilient and strong. And then there are other therapies like art therapy and music therapy. Um, very, very helpful therapies. Really, um, they capitalize on people's uh, talents and skills and, uh, and inclinations. And, um, you know, if you're an artist, you've got to do art. And really, that's where you uh, connect with uh, other parts of your being. So art therapy is very helpful for that. And musicians have to you know, use music, they have to play music, they have to listen to music, they're surrounded by music. And so of course, uh, why wouldn't they use music in their therapy also to understand who they are and understand their needs and to really meet them. So I wanted to spend some time on, on this slide, personal tools. Um, Self-care is at the foundation of your resiliency and your ability to, uh, utilize your tools, your strengths, to really come to understand the power that you have and the ability to mitigate uh, problematic anxiety and to keep yourself from getting into a depressive episode. And I, and I chose these two pictures in particular um, of, of, these, of these cats. I, I saw them, I've seen them uh, in journals and whatnot, but I, I took these pictures at a museum in, um, in Baltimore uh, because they're, they're from an artist who suffers from mental illness and um, they are of the same cat, but one painting is of when they were not uh, healthy. And then the other painting is after some treatment and being healthy. So you can probably figure out which is which. Um, the one, the cat that actually looks like a cat and is smiling and looks kind of happy on the, on the left side is when they were in uh, a healthy space and then the other one is when they were in a, in a very unhealthy space so it, i just think that's such a great depiction of um of what self-care and how important it is for us to pay attention to ourselves and our mental health uh, it's reflective in everything that we do it's reflective in our physical health in our relationships and well, how we think about ourselves it's a daily practice we have to practice our self-care even when we don't feel bad, even when we feel good. We have to continue to practice and pay attention to what we need. It's more than taking care of our physical needs. That, that's kind of the, um, the uh, 
first thing that we do, you know, we shower, we brush our teeth, we wash our face, we, you know, wear clean clothes. That's, that's very important. Those are the basics. And absolutely, we have to practice the basics every day. But it's more than that, too. We have to go a little bit deeper and start to ask ourselves, you know, how are we feeling today? What, what space are we in? Am I happy today? Uh, am I sad? Am I worried? Am I anxious? And then ask even more questions like, hmm, what's making me feel anxious? What's making me feel kind of out of sorts? Is, did something happen? Am I thinking something? Uh, am I being reminded of an anniversary of something that was not so, not so good? Uh, maybe I don't know what's going on, but I'm going to pay attention to it. And uh, what can I do today to help me feel a little bit better? And then experiment with how to manage that stress and how to uh, help yourself get to a point of contentedness. We don't have to feel super joyful and euphoric all the time, right? Because that's a high dopamine state, which is not, not where we can be all the time, it's unrealistic. Uh, but if we can get to a state where we're content and we feel like, hey, we can manage the day-to-day, -day. I, can, I, I, I can feel those stressors and I can feel whatever challenges come today. Or you feel like, uh, I think I'm at my bandwidth right now and a little bit more is not going to, uh, not gonna feel good. So how can I expand that bandwidth? What do I need for myself to do that? Do I need to sleep? Do I need to give myself some nutrition? Do I need to exercise? Do I need to connect with a good friend? Do I need to reach out to my parents or my sibling or to my child? Do I need a cuddle with my pet? Do I need a hug from my significant other? Um, what do I need? And to really look at those needs without judgment. So it's okay, whatever it is that you need, go ahead and get it, go ahead and ask for it, as long as it's healthy. Um, if you feel like you need something that's unhealthy, then you've got to ask yourself, why am I reaching for something that's unhealthy for me? That's not really going to make me feel good in the long run. So why don't I look for something that's going to make me feel good in the long run? One of my, um, so what, I, I went through a divorce uh, about over 10 years ago, but it was one of the most, uh, uh, devastating, difficult periods of my life. And my, uh, my attorney said to me, she said, you know what, I, um, I have this whole new outlook in life. And, uh, and what I do now is I don't do anything that isn't good for me. And I thought, wow, that's a really great, uh, great motto to have, because if you are committed to not doing anything that isn't good for you, then that means you're committed to only doing things that are good for you. So, so if, you, if you commit to that motto for yourself, then you're going to really look for activities, thought processes, behaviors, relationships, food, uh, drinks, whatever, uh, exercise, whatever actually is good for you and only do that. Um, so I like that motto and I have, I've tried to adopt that for myself, um, although there is no try, right? So I have adopted it for myself and, um, and I, I, I do what's good for me and I, and I make my decisions according to, is this good for me or is it not good for me? And then go forward and I encourage you to do the same thing. Parenting tools, because uh, I think we're all parents in some ways, whether we have a parent, uh, whether we're parenting a child of our own or an adopted child or a foster child or a, uh, a child in our family as an aunt or uncle, um, or we could be parenting our inner child, right? We're parenting ourselves as well all through our lives. So learning parenting tools is so important for every single person. And uh, first thing to do is to focus on your self-care like we talked about just a few minutes ago. And then the second thing is to focus on your relationship with your children. I do believe that all healing comes through relationships. I, I learned that as a very young, uh, psychiatrist in training, one of my mentors told me, you know what, it's the relationship that you create with your patient that is going to give you the ability to help that patient. And depending on the quality of that relationship that you create with your patient, that's going to determine the quality of your care as a psychiatrist, as a physician, as a therapist, as a person. Uh, 
Um, it's all in that relationship. And it is my responsibility to create that relationship with my patient that allows for healing to occur. And I, and I took that to heart and I've been thinking about it every day of my career and my adult life. And I do believe it's true for everything that we do and everybody that we meet. And it's also true for ourselves. So we have to think about that relationship that we create with ourselves first, because the relationship we create with ourselves is going to be exactly the same relationship that we create with every other person that we meet in our world. The relationship that we create with our children, with our spouse, with our friends, our family, with strangers as well, is going to be exactly the same relationship that you create with yourself. And it's not gonna take any work to do that with other people because if you put the work in to creating that relationship with yourself and make it super healthy and joyful and helpful to yourself, then it's just going to be second nature. It's going to happen automatically and you are going to do the same thing with other people. So as you practice making that relationship with yourself, you're going to learn how to be compassionate. You're gonna learn how to breathe and pause. You're gonna learn how to ask the right questions of yourself so that you can learn what you need and you can learn what you need to do in order to rectify how you feel or to mitigate your problematic feelings. You're gonna learn how to listen to yourself with acceptance, with tolerance, without judgment and unconditionally, with compassion and with kindness. You're gonna learn how to relate to yourself with that same compassion, with that unconditional love. You're gonna develop that to yourself. You're gonna learn how to be attuned to your needs. You're gonna learn how to share and express yourself to other people and obtain what you need to feel better from other people. You're gonna learn how to be patient with yourself because it's not a perfect practice. And you're gonna learn how to get help. And guess what? That's exactly what you need to do in your relationship with other people. So if you learn how to do that with yourself, you're gonna learn how to do that with other people. I used to hear this very cliched uh, statement, and I, I'm sure you guys have heard it too, where people say, if you don't know how to love yourself, you're not gonna be able to love other people. Or if you don't love yourself, you can't love another person. Well, I, I disagree with that because I don't think it's about loving ourselves. I think we do love ourselves, but we forget how to love ourselves. And uh, through trauma and our life experiences and negative statements and all the manipulation, of course, in um, in society and uh, consumerism and people trying to manipulate us to to uh, buy things and that kind of stuff um, we get uh, we get insecure about how to love ourselves so we have to learn how to love ourselves and as we learn those tools and we and we do that then we'll be able to translate that into how we interact with other people and Gregory, your comment, as a parent, it's clear adult children still require parental responses to their world. Absolutely. You are always a parent, even if your child is 40 years old or 50 years old, they always need their parents. Uh, they need that relationship. It changes, you know, uh, as, as, as needs change, but absolutely always, always need our parents to be parents. And as, as we're parents, we have to take that responsibility also of, of being the parent for our children, of being patient and kind and, and uh, compassionate to them, understanding that they're growing too. You know, we're always growing. We're trying to figure out how to navigate through these challenges of life at any age. And, uh, and if we're lucky enough to have our parents uh, well into our adult uh, years, um, we still need them and uh, we're quite grateful for having them. Wonderful comment, thank you. The importance of relationships. I kind of talked about this already because I think it's so important. This is a picture of my son with one of my one of my best friends who is a, a PhD psychologist and her youngest uh, youngest son. And we spent uh, several weeks with them uh, about two years ago before COVID. And um, and I just love uh, that we have this relationship and that my son has this relationship with her children. And it really does bring so much joy to our lives to have relationships. So so very important. So. Uh, that's why I put that picture there. Um, I talked about how healing progresses through relationships, our personal healing, our healing that we, that we um, inspire in other people. Uh, so important. Our bottom line here, let me move the chat box. Uh, relationships are important and absolutely at the foundation of our well-being. I believe this with all my heart. Um, 
So I encourage you also to pay attention to your relationships. One thing I, I think the silver lining of COVID, well, both, both the silver lining and uh, and the and one of the struggles of uh, the pandemic and being in close quarters with all of our family is that we can't run away from the little. Uh, challenges, uh, the little obstacles, the, uh, the, the difficulties that we might have had in our relationships within our, our families and our friends and our, our close people. Um, they're face to face and we've had to deal with it on a day to day basis, which has brought about some challenges and difficulties. But I think it is uh, the silver lining to have those challenges because we can't avoid them. And I don't think that we should avoid them because relationships are so important to our well-being um, that to pay attention to these difficulties uh, is a good thing. It's, a, it's an opportunity to grow. It's an opportunity to be healthier. It's an opportunity to develop those relationships. So um, as difficult as it is, I think it's a good thing for all of us to, to be, uh, come face to face with these challenges and struggles that we have in, with our relationships and in our relationships, even with ourselves, because we've had to spend a lot of time with ourselves. Um, and so we've, we've come to realize that uh, there, we, we don't treat ourselves as well as we should. We don't treat ourselves with as much understanding and as much openness and unconditional love and compassion as we should. So this is my contact information. I have a website, www drguyany.com and you can reach me through there. You can send me email, I get it. And I will respond to you um, as soon as I possibly can. Uh, and I thank you so much for your attention and I'm looking forward to questions. I hope we have time for questions. I, I think I talked a lot more than I expected, but thank you. Guyany, like I have so many questions here. <laughs> That's such a great presentation. And I just, I love everything that you've talked about. So I'm hoping we can fit in. I'm, I'm going to try to be careful which ones I bring up. Thank you so much for that great information. Um, no matter how long I've known you and no matter how, how long I've worked with you, um, you never cease to teach me and I learn new information. So I just thank you. Those are beautiful presentation. Everybody, as you watched, you can see pictures of Henry. And I've met him. He is an amazing child. So if you need anything regarding how she is as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, like knowing her and her child is like, yeah, she knows what she's doing. So a, a couple things I, I want to get to. You did have some um, questions. One, so I'll go to those ones first before um, some other ones that came up. Um, Tracy asked, this is a great question. I don't want to hit too long on it on, in regarding medications, but how do the antidepressants affect the brain long-term, like after you get off of them? Might natural serotonin production be stunted or turned off in response to the artificial serotonin production? Oh, that is a fantastic question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, so what it does, so basically when people are depressed, you should stay on the uh, serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor for a year. And that recommendation is because um, it, really mitigates, it really reduces the risk of another depressive episode. Because what happens during that year is the brain does recalibrate to, um, to that serotonin level. And so, uh, but it also, during that year with therapy, um, therapy affects serotonin production as well. So as you learn and build new pathways in the brain through therapy, the medication maintains that level of serotonin uh, while, while the therapy also affects serotonin um, development. It's a little bit complicated. So if you stay on it for a year, you just make sure that there's enough serotonin to make those pathways and then for the brain to start making its own serotonin. So, um, so after the year, you wean off of the serotonin medication, and then the therapy does uh, kind of make sure that there's enough serotonin. It does in time, uh, and with added stressors, new stressors and new challenges, uh, the brain may not have as much serotonin development. So that development might come down, and the, so they might need another um, round of um, serotonin uh, medication to boost that serotonin up again to learn new skills. So that's what happens. It doesn't really shut off or, um, or change the serotonin production. Um, it really does help maintain the serotonin level along with therapy. 
to really maintain it even longer. So what it does is that it, it, um, it extends the time in between episodes. So if you do have a depressive episode that needs treatment, like a clinical depression, you are at a higher risk because you do get more vulnerable to having another depressive episode. But being on that medication for a year and engaging in treatment and therapy for over a year extends that time, that period between needing uh, medication. Because I kind of... Um, yeah, and no, I think that's great information. And and some of these questions, and, and we'll get into it, are are just you know you go you go into more depth than like your books, especially regarding medications and stuff. So I think touching on the surface of that is is really is really great. Um, I'm going to try to make this large question into a smaller one, but we you know we have a lot of multicultural societies and kind of going into children, teens, and tweens. Um, how might this affect them and their parents? And I kind of had other questions regarding that and generational mm -hmm. stress and anxiety, what that causes regarding the parents and what that causes regarding the teens. And that could be cultural or just in general. Um, do you have any comments to, to maybe say about that? Yeah, that is a huge question, <laughs> um, yeah. but it's a great yes. question because all treatment, all ways of understanding what people need have to be uh, contextualized in this cultural context. So we cannot, we cannot look at a person's needs without considering everything else that's in their life, right? So, and everybody brings their cultural uh, life, their, cult, their, their present cultural context, their past cultural context, all those challenges, they absolutely, um, play into what's going on right now in, in the present. So we can we have to um, address that. There's, I mean, one thing I love about psychiatry and particularly about child and adolescent psychiatry is that one depression isn't the same as another because everybody is different and everyone comes from these cultural um, differences. And even within the same culture, their, their experience is different, right? So, um, so everyone is very different. We have to individualize it. So the general idea of really paying attention and putting energy and effort into understanding and learning how to understand a person and understand yourself with all the complexities that make yourself make that other person um, that's really where the work is and that's really why it's very very difficult and it takes time it takes a lot of energy there are no simple answers for this you know i am um, i'm a co-host once a month on a program called white coat um, that airs in uh, la and in cairo and it's a um it's a christian arabic uh tv show and so what I say is translated into Arabic. And so I get questions all the time from people in Egypt um, asking about depression and mental illness um, from that cultural uh, perspective. And it's so important because people do raise their children in different ways, depending on their cultural context. Uh, not right, not wrong, just, uh, just in a different way. And it does impact how people um, grow up and how they contend with anxiety or how anxiety or depression manifests. So, um, so yeah, we, we cannot get away from ignoring the cultural uh, aspect. We cannot get away with any simple answers. We cannot get away with any simple solutions. Uh, everyone is a unique individual and we really have to understand people in all of their complexity. And I think that will be a, a growing issue as I'm someone who's got a multicultural background, but I think as this, country becomes more and more diverse, there's going to be a lot of people with multicultural backgrounds. I think it's important to understand and listen and pay attention. So I think that's really smart. Um, so we've got another question. Might you speak about how important abstinence from sugar and high fructose corn syrup is? And you do talk about this also in your book. Nutrition is so important. And, and Guyani does talk about this. So great question. Um, you know, so this is the more the question. There's a, another psychiatrist who uses food to change lives. Medications can go in. Medication freedom from grain may also be necessary too. So do you want to hit on the subject of, um, in the book, she covers nutrition and uh, teens and tweens, but would love to hear a little bit of a brief of, about nutrition. Oh yeah, nutrition is so, so important. So there's a whole new um, field of understanding coming up in medicine called a uh, food or called nutrition as medicine. And, um, and, I, and I'm really happy for that because whatever we take into our bodies absolutely affects our brain. Um, 
and affects our gut and we, we have nerves all over our body and it's affected by all the nutrition that we take in and sugar is just awful <laughs> it's such an awful awful thing that we take into our bodies uh, especially uh, processed sugar it uh, causes inflammation that's probably the biggest thing and it causes inflammation everywhere in in our bodies it causes inflammation in our blood cells it causes inflammation in our blood vessels it increases heart disease it causes diabetes it um it causes depression it um so there's a wonderful book actually um that i that i read several months ago um called uh the angel or the assassin anyway it talks about how inflammation in the body actually stimulates these little tiny cells that, we, that nobody really paid attention to until several years ago um, called microglia that actually causes inflammation in the brain and can cause uh, can stimulate things like dementia uh, depression anxiety like really bad things in the brain and we're learning more about it and that's why I'm kind of talking about it in sort of a vague way um, because it's such a new uh, understanding that we have but that's the kind of the connection between inflammation in the body and inflammation in the brain I think that sugar is going to be a big culprit uh, in this as we learn more about it um, but uh, in, in my second book, actually, the, uh, Stop Teen Addiction Before It Starts, I do talk a little bit about appetitive uh, behaviors is also addictive. So it's not just taking in substances. Uh, it's also sugar. Uh, it's also like video gaming, anything, any behaviors that uh, become excessive and are used to mitigate our feelings, uh, are used in, to avoid dealing with uh, very problematic, uncomfortable feelings and situations, and instead moving towards uh, eating incorrectly or video gaming or using social media to help appease and avoid really looking at whatever is actually bothering us does develop these problematic pathways in our brains that lead towards addiction. So, um, so yeah, high fructose corn syrup is so, so processed that also that's just like taking in sugar you might as well just eat teaspoons of sugar um if you know <laughs> if you're gonna have have uh, products that have high fructose uh corn sugar and it's even worse than than sugar um and just you know expect to have inflammation all over your body expect to have heart disease expect to develop diabetes etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah, and, and I think that high fructose curse this high fructose corn syrup is something so easy. Just look on the label, make sure it's not there. It doesn't need to be there. It's unnecessary. It there. And I wanted to say about food is when you stop eating fake food, if you try to go back to eat it, you actually realize it's fake food. Like I don't eat fast food and I've tried it. I'm just like, if you stop eating it, you'll actually realize how gross it is. Like, and that just it's not good for you. Well, um, yeah. if you eat, um, if you try, you know, I actually never ate McDonald's uh French fries until med school when my friends corrupted me. Uh, but um, you got to eat them when they're hot, right? Because that's when they're when the lab created flavor is present. But if you try to eat them when they're cold, they don't taste like food. <laughs> yeah, it, right. Versus potatoes you make at home. It's, yes. it, it's food. Um, so there, this is another great question. So Sharon is saying, my son, who's 13 and a half, has identified that he has societal anxiety. He's also a very picky, picky eater and has said he's afraid new foods will ch choke kill him. So there's a, she's got one question here, but it, it brings up a couple interesting things. Can you suggest first steps in helping him? That's the, the first question. Um, and kind of, I wanna backhand that question with just dealing with a child or a tween with anxiety. How is a parent even just in general work with that child to kind of overcome any kind of anxiety and even have like steps to even make help them with like a doctor or something yeah great question um so before answering what to do i always want to understand what the issue is so i i you know when i when i see um patients uh, in my private practice um I will schedule you know, 60 minutes and 90 minutes for teenagers. And pretty much I spend 75% of that time asking questions and listening and trying to really understand what's going on before I, figuring out what to do is kind of the easy part of, um, of all of this, uh, of, of my work. Uh, that's really the easy part. The hard part is what is going on 
what does this child need? What's happened um, to bring them to this point where they're, they're having difficulties? Um, and so as a parent, I would encourage you to, um, to find out what's going on. So what's behind um, uh, being afraid of being choked by food? Uh, when did that start? What kinds of thoughts were, were occurring at the beginning? And then how did they develop to where it is right now? Because it didn't happen overnight. It, there definitely was a progression. Uh, is there a medical reason for it? Is there a, a psychiatric reason for it? Is there a developmental reason for it? Um, so we'll have to do a lot of um, assessing. So probably um, meeting with a child psychiatrist um, to start that process of assessment. And then um, I would recommend probably uh, an assessment with occupational therapy, pediatric occupational therapy, so that they can do some testing also about other, um, other sensory issues and other ways that the brain is interacting with muscles uh, and sensory input in the body. Uh, occupational therapy uh, for, for children is really, really good about that. Um, they do some super fun and interesting kinds of testing because usually if you find one um, area of difficulty with communication between the brain and, uh, and, the, and the body, there's usually other places too where that communication is disrupted, but you may not notice um, the problem uh, right away. It may be too subtle to notice or it just hasn't, uh, you know, hasn't just come up yet, but it will. So, um, so the OT evaluation is super important to um, help identify um, any, any um, problematic uh, areas in the, the development of connecting the brain to uh, other parts of your body. Um, it, it, there are like neurodevelopmental um, issues. So children are always developing. Um, we can uh, intervene and, um, and change the course of that development. Um, pretty much at any age, but especially be, you know, in, before they become young adults. Uh, that's, those are critical times. So I forgot how old you said that, that child was. Um, 13 teen, and a half. 13 and a half, yeah. So there's plenty of, of time to really um, figure it out and help, uh, help develop new pathways in that child's brain. But I would first go see a child, an adolescent psychiatrist and get an evaluation with that person uh, to help you um, with uh, figuring out what's going on and then figuring out what to do. Again, figuring out what to do that's the easy part. Figuring out why, what, how, um, and how you're at this point, um, that's the hard part. And that's what really takes a lot of time and effort to figure that out. So um, I recommend you get a lot of assessments. So I, I want to value everybody's time. And again, I have a million questions. I won't even go into any of them. I just want to end on one more note because um, this is kind of in the news right now. And we're in this moment specifically. So just very briefly, Kenya, I'm putting you on the spot here, but I know that you've already been quoted on languishing. Oh, Can languishing. you give us a little bit about languishing and let's end on that. Yeah, so languishing is this term that came about like in 2002, I think, um, that, uh, that describes where you're not depressed, like clinically depressed, you're, but you're not thriving either. You're not really doing like, as well as you would like to do. You're just kind of like, blah. Uh, it's kind of hard to get out of bed. You do eventually get out of bed, but it's kind of hard to do it. You kind of you know, brush your teeth without much enthusiasm, kind of go through your day without a whole lot of enthusiasm. Uh, you may not get to everything that you want to do. Uh, it may be more fun to just kind of sit on the couch and watch TV. But, um, and so that's really languishing. And the way to get out of languishing is to make a decision. Don't let yourself just kind of stay in that languishing state because you have choices. And again, it's about that relationship with yourself, so, right? So if you accept this relationship where you don't really care or you don't really want to put any effort into understanding yourself and doing something good for yourself, um, then you're going, to stay, uh, you're going to stay stuck in that languishing um, state. And, um, and that languishing state can lead you into a depression or an anxiety disorder because you're not doing anything to really help yourself. So make a choice, just do something. Get off the couch, get yourself a glass of water, do something that's healthy for you. And as, as long as you keep making those choices, it will stimulate you and your brain to get more motivated. It will stimulate more energy. It will stimulate more interest in yourself and, and you will start to feel a little bit happier, a little more joyful, a little more content, which pulls you out of that languishing zone. 
which is really where a lot of people are right now, trying to get back out as things start opening up again. Yeah, so, there's so many stressors right now. There's so many challenges, and it is easier, kind of, <laughs> kind of easier in the um, in the short term to avoid it. But avoidance is like our biggest enemy because if we avoid the things that are uncomfortable or we avoid making choices for ourselves, we avoid being healthy, that just leads us down a path that um, it's, it's down, down into the gutter, basically. It's down into areas where it's really hard to get ourselves out of. So, um, so avoid avoidance. <laughs> don't, avoid, uh, don't avoid the things that make you anxious. Don't avoid things that make you uncomfortable. Uh, move into it, lean into it, try to understand it, have some faith in yourself that you can understand it. And once you understand it, it's easy to fix. It really, really is. But you've got to have that understanding in order to find the answers. The answers are the easy part. It's the understanding that's the hard part. So I get like just great information. Again, that's such a timely topic. So thank you for hitting on it. Thank you everybody for joining again. Gaini De Silva, a child and adolescent psychiatrist. She's absolutely amazing. She's got two books out. If you have a teen or tween or know somebody who has a teen or tween, they're amazing books. You can find her on tvguestbook.com if you don't go to her own website. But um, thank you everybody for coming. Please find her and um, you can again go to tvguestbook.com. You can reach out to our office if you want to reach out to her um, assistant at tvguestbook.com. But again, thank you for joining us. And Gaini, thank you for your great information. And thank everybody, you. we'll see you hopefully uh, next month when we do our next one. Everybody take care and stay safe.